um prazer recebê-los aqui é, no INSPE. É um prazer hoje ter aqui de novo o Ed Glazer. Né? Acho que quando o um livro é realmente bom, você tem que lançar pelo menos duas vezes, o que é o caso aqui. Né? O livro do Ed teve uma da cidade, teve um, uma edição há, há alguns anos atrás, enfim, não era tão tradução tinha, e aí a Bey se encarregou essa missão, acho que importante, de retraduzir o livro e organizar essa discussão sobre cidade. Acho que, infelizmente, nos últimos, nos últimos anos, a gravidade da crise econômica do Brasil nos afastou dos, dos problemas profundos que afetam o nosso cotidiano. Né? Acho que o Brasil vinha numa rota de se tornar um país mais arrumado, com regras mais claras do jogo, instituições mais bem estabelecidas. Achei que a macro tinha deixado esse tema e o país começava a enfrentar outros pontos importantes, como a desigualdade, educação, gestão, qualidade da gestão pública. Esses eram temas na agenda nos anos 2000, 90, 2000. Infelizmente, nos últimos anos, retrocedemos. Né? Estamos discutindo temas que já deviam ser pacificados. Equilíbrio fiscal, macroeconomia em ordem, enfim. Temos um desafio longo pela frente. Mas eu acho que a gravidade da crise econômica, ela é grave. Né? Ainda tem sinais de uma relativa estabilidade da economia. Se reformas profundas, duras, difíceis, não foram feitas, essa crise retoma com mais força mais tarde, que é o que eu temo que possa acontecer. Uh, mas isso não deve impedir que nós retomemos uma agenda de discutir os demais temas da economia, os temas que afetam o nosso cotidiano. Como melhorar a regulação do setor de saúde, como melhorar o ambiente de negócio, a gestão das empresas. E, certamente, um tema central no Brasil é o tema da cidade. Né? É, acho que a, a cidade no Brasil expressa bem o nosso fracasso na política pública. Né? A quantidade de planos diretores que São Paulo teve, com as regras mais disparatadas possíveis, né? Essa, esse Estado que fica refém de grupos de interesse em todos os níveis. E nada melhor para retomar essa agenda do que ter hoje aqui a Ed Gleiser com a gente, é, e agradeço aqui a Marisa e a Tomás, é, que coordenaram o livro, e Cláudio, é, que viabilizou esse processo aqui hoje. Então, aos três, muito obrigado. Para comentar depois a, a, o debate, tem aqui o prazer é, de ter Sérgio Lazzarini, professor titular do INSPIR Estratégia, agora membro da Cátedra... Já é, é, fiz saudade, Haddad, né? não está no público, não? Nosso Sérgio Lazzarini. É, e a Ana Carla Costa, secretária é, de Fazenda de Goiás, que gentilmente tem dedicado o seu tempo para vir comentar esse livro tão importante. Para continuar a introdução, chamo aqui Tomás Alvim, da B Editora. Tomás, obrigado, gente. Obrigado, Marcos. Obrigado ao Cláudio e à equipe do INSPER, que sempre tão bem nos acolhem aqui. É um prazer enorme, mais uma vez, estar aqui nessa, nessa tarde com vocês. E obrigado ao professor Eduardo Glazer, é a terceira vez que a gente tem o privilégio de tê-lo aqui no Brasil, e sempre foi, a gente considera, enfim, são não só as palestras deles, mas principalmente o livro dele como uma obra de referência que muito inspira as discussões que o Arco Futuro vem promovendo ao longo desses últimos anos. Nós aproveitamos, enfim, o lançamento desse livro e aproveitando também que nós temos aí as próximas eleições municipais, e como o Marcos disse muito bem, que coincidem com a emergência de uma nova consciência sobre a, a situação das cidades contemporâneas, quer dizer, essa é uma questão no Brasil dramática, enfim, com uma situação no modo geral, mas ela é uma questão importante no mundo. Né? Nós temos já mais de metade da população vivendo em cidades, e esse é um número que vai incrementar até nos próximos 30, 40 anos, dramaticamente. Ou seja, nós vamos ver um mundo urbanizado. E a cidade está no centro da discussão de todo mundo, seja na questão da qualidade de vida, na competitividade, enfim, na empregabilidade, enfim, na fruição, no bom espaço público, etc. Eu acho que o Ed, no livro dele, aborda isso de uma maneira muito importante. Então, a nossa a grande descoberta é que a gente precisa realmente começar a descobrir e implementar novas soluções, né? quer dizer, que tornem viáveis as metrópoles em que vivemos e que, de fato, é, transformem essa cidade de uma maneira qualitativa é, significativa. Acho que essa é uma agenda urgente e o Marcos colocou isso muito bem. Nós temos quatro anos de mandato pela frente, nós vamos escolher prefeitos e vereadores, é, e acho que nós estamos passando por um processo político muito importante, acho que de uma conscientização, acho que nunca antes vista no Brasil. Quer dizer, há uma, uma politização, há uma polarização, mas há, de fato, uma consciência de que nós temos que votar melhor, ou seja, que as escolhas têm que ser mais racionais, as escolhas têm que ser mais adequadas para os desafios que nós temos à frente. Então, acho que essa é uma questão extremamente importante. E, em função disso, nós estamos lançando, hoje é o início de uma série, 
aproveitando esse nome brilhante do livro, que é o Triunfo da Cidade, como o Ed Glazer defende a melhor invenção da humanidade, nós estamos lançando uma série aqui em parceria com o INSPER e com as nossas duas plataformas de discussão, que é o Arco Futuro e o Porquê. Né? O Porquê é uma plataforma que discute, é, passa conceitos de economia, de ajuda, promove enfim, o, o entendimento das questões econômicas, que vai chamar a série O Triunfo da Cidade, onde, ao longo de uma série de debates, nós vamos contribuir para a reflexão sobre os novos rumos que as cidades eh, devem tomar, enfim, das discussões eh, que as cidades devem adotar e da importância de uma escolha de uma governança local. Acho que essa é uma questão fundamental e acho que está no centro da nossa discussão. De forma em que as cidades possam ser mais equitativas, que as cidades possam enfim, diminuir a desigualdade, que as cidades possam ser mais competitivas. Né? Eu acho que esse é um ponto eh, extremamente importante. E, por fim, nós acreditamos que a educação ela é fundamental para o exercício da cidadania e é o caminho para a construção de cidades mais humanas, inteligentes e participativas. É, o, ser, o, o, o a, a consciência desses deveres ela é fundamental, acho que essa é a agenda que a gente tem, e a gente entende que trazendo esses exemplos e trazendo bom é, conhecimento sobre essas questões ajudará a gente a pensar e a ter iniciativas mais transformadoras. Sobre o autor... É, o professor Eduardo Gleiser ele é PhD pela Universidade de Chicago, é professor de Economia na Universidade de Harvard e pesquisador das relações entre economia e desenvolvimento urbano, tendo publicado vários estudos sobre o assunto. Foi diretor do Taubman Center for State and Local Government e do Rappaport Institute of Greater, Greater Boston, instituições vinculadas a Harvard. Colabora regularmente com artigos relacionados à economia e urbanismo em publicações especializadas e em jornais e revistas como The New York Times e Wall Street Journal. Um dos maiores especialistas em economia urbana da atualidade, Eduardo Glazer tem se dedicado a analisar em profundidade as cidades modernas. O triunfo da cidade é o resultado desse monumental trabalho de pesquisa e, desde o seu lançamento, tem sido considerado o mais completo e atualizado estudo sobre o assunto. É, publicado pela primeira vez nos Estados Unidos em 2011, o livro está sendo lançado em segunda, em segunda edição no Brasil. Revisada e atualizada por um prefácio do próprio autor, a obra apresenta um amplo panorama das cidades antigas e contemporâneas, revelando como o contato próximo entre as pessoas nas áreas urbanas desperta as melhores características da espécie humana. Segundo Glazer, a mistura de ideias, valores e culturas que ocorrem no ambiente urbano não apenas amplia as fronteiras do conhecimento, como nos torna mais empáticos, produtivos e criativos. Eu queria, por fim, antes, chamar o professor Gleis, agradecer aos nossos apoiadores, é, que tem sido o INSPER, sempre o nosso parceiro, a Itajubá e a HMC Itajubá, que tem sido apoiadora aí de uma série de livros e de debates que nós temos promovidos aqui conjuntamente com o INSPER, a Abra Inc. e a Forma Soluções. É, queria chamar o professor Edgar Gleiser aqui ao palco e um bom evento a todos. Obrigado. <laughs> Thank you very much. This was enormously, enormously kind. I'm very grateful to, to everyone who, who brought me here, to INSPIRE, to BEI, uh, to Architect Futura, and so forth. Um, this is really a tremendous treat for me, and I was so glad to have the chance to write a little something new for a second edition of, of uh, my book. In fact, you know, I, I, one of the great joys of working on cities is they always give you something new to learn. And it was nice at least to be able to recognize how much I didn't know when I wrote that book five years ago, and, and that at least I've made a little bit of, of steps towards knowing a little bit more since then. Um, I want to start with this famous quote of Gandhi's, uh, which is, I regard the growth of cities as an evil thing, unfortunate for mankind and the world. And I want to start with this quotation for three reasons. One, of one reason, of course, is to register just how strongly and completely I disagree with this statement. That, in fact, on this one, I think Gandhi could not have been more wrong. Um, the second reason I want to put this up, I wanted to start with this, is that it reminds us of how deeply strong the strain of anti-urbanism is throughout the world. And I am not saying no part of this discussion should be meant to suggest that everyone should live in a city. I'm an economist. I believe in choices. I believe in freedom. I believe that great cities are archipelagos of neighborhood that give people different options about where to live. And I'm not in any sense suggesting that every human being should live in a city. But there's a lot to like about cities. And the prevailing anti-urbanist mood that you often get, right, 
is exactly the wrong answer. So I cannot tell you how many times I have been talking to some political leader who has said, oh, you're an expert in cities. That's great. Can you tell me how to stop the poor people from coming to my city? Because they're ruining it for me. Uh, they're ruining it for us. This is completely the wrong answer. Right? It's, there is no future in rural poverty. Right? It is true that large-scale migration of poor people to cities creates challenges. It is also, it is even more true that it makes poverty visible when it was invisible in rural areas. But the right answer is to fight to make cities livable. It's the right to fight to make cities more humane, to fight to make transportation problems less severe, to make sure that neighborhoods are safer. In some sense, the great challenge of making cities humane is in some sense the great challenge of the 21st century. Because there is no future in anything else other than urbanization. And making sure that our cities are fulfilling their potential for both rich and poor alike is an incredibly high calling. Um, the third reason why I put this up here is to remind us, of course, that Gandhi is not a symbol of economics by any stretch of the imagination, right? Gandhi is, is a humanist and is famous for it. And I think one of the points that I want to really stress here is that while there will be economics, and I'm about to give you a couple more, more very economics-oriented graphs, that much of what is special and good about cities has nothing to do with dollars and cents or with reais, right? It has to do with something that's very basic to us, with the fact that we as human beings are a profoundly social species, that it is our greatest talent, is our ability to work with one another, to learn things from each other, to borrow ideas from the people around us. We are intellectual magpies, after all, and we become smart by being around other smart people. Cities play to our greatest assets, and they succeed not because they run counter to our humanity, but because they enlarge and expand our humanity. Um, but with that, let's start with the economics. So in 2007, humanity crossed that halfway point where more than half of us live in cities. And it's hard not to think that that's on net a relatively good thing, because when we compare those countries that are more than 50% urban to those countries that are less than 50% urban, the more urbanized countries have on average incomes that are five times higher and infant mortality levels that are less than a third. This just shows the relationship between urbanization in 1910 and per capita GDP. This does not mean that we should artificially force cities but it does mean that, in fact, we know no thing of a, we have no great examples of highly rich rural nations. It doesn't exist. There is a pathway that moves, and urbanization is part of that process. Indeed, if we looked back in 1960, and we looked at urbanization in 1960, and we then looked at subsequent growth, 1960 to 2010, and this is just among countries with per capita GDP below $5,000, you see a very strong correlation where the more urbanized countries are the ones that experienced the fastest growth whereas the less urbanized countries did not. Again, not meaning to suggest that we should in any sense artificially force anyone who wants to live in rural areas to a city. Not meaning to suggest that we should ignore improving the quality of rural services. But if you think that there is a future that is not urban, then you think that there is a future that is poor. That in fact there is not a way that a country develops that we know of that does not involve urbanization. Now, one of the things that's really amazing that's happened over the past 50 years is that we've seen urbanization of poor places that didn't exist. So if you go back to 1960, and this compares 1960, the blue bars, and 2010, the red bars, and you ask yourself, what share of countries at different levels of income were reasonably urbanized? And each one of these graphs shows the share of countries in each income block that is more than one-third urban. And one-third urban means reasonably urban. It's not, not meant to be anything more than that. So what this shows you is that in 1960 and in 2010, and of course I've corrected for inflation here, those countries that had between four and five thousand dollars, 80 percent were about 80 percent were more than one third urban in 1960. About 80 percent are more than one third urban in 2010. About the same. If you go to three to four thousand, it was 100 percent in 1960. Now it's about 80 percent, but still very high levels. The big changes has occurred down here. The big changes occurred in those countries that were enormously poor then. Some of them are enormously poor now. Ask yourself, what share of countries that had per capita incomes below $1,000 in 1960, what share of them were more than one-third urban? It's a really easy number to remember. Zero. None. Not a one. Because in 1960, to be poor, to be really poor, was to be rural, which has been true throughout almost all of human history. Go to one to 2,000, one in five such countries were more than one-third urban. Today, more than 40% of the poorest countries on the planet are more than one-third urban. More than 60% of the countries between uh, one and two thousand dollars are more than one third urban. You have a rise of poor world urbanization that is absolutely amazing. Now, 
understanding this phenomenon is one question, which is, which is fabulously interesting, and we'll come back to that later. But it is also means that we have a rise of places that are urban, that are dense, but are both poor and very often poorly governed. And consequently, you have cities like Kinshasa that are trying to deal with the same problems of density that richer places deal with, with congestion, with bad water, with crime, and yet they're doing it on a shoestring that is unimaginable. And I think one of the points that I want to make here today is that there is enormous tendency when I work with countries, with cities in sub-Saharan Africa, they look to the US, they look to England, they look to France, and we have very little to give them. But you do, in fact. Brazil has actually fought on battles like formalization or clean water within recent memory. You have actually something to, to say to Nigeria that, in fact, America does not. And I think one of the things that's really important is to recognize that Brazil, despite continuing challenges, has a repository of expertise in these areas that is, in fact, enormously valuable. And that that really has to be part of the urban future for the developing countries of the world, is to look to Latin America in general, and to Brazil in specific, to knowledge in this area. Returning back to Gandhi on this, um, now you could take the view, well, I've just put up two economics graphs, that in fact, sure, cities are associated with wealth, but they're also pretty miserable places, right? I mean, favelas, miserable places, slums of, of sub-Saharan Africa, pretty miserable places, right? But that's not what the data shows. So what this is, is it's self-reported life satisfaction, happiness. And it shows the gulf between rural happiness and urban happiness in different countries of the world. So the zero line means that people who live in rural areas and urban areas are equally happier, equally happy. If the point is above the line, it means that people who live in cities are happier. If it's below the line, it means that people who live in rural areas are, ha are happier. In rich places, there's not much of a difference. Uh, whatsoever. You know, in, the, in Sweden, the urbanites are happier. In Switzerland, the rural dwellers are happier. But it's sort of clustered around it. If you go to very poor places, it's very clear. Right? Overwhelmingly, the people who live in cities say they are happier. It's not that they are coming to, to cities and they're foregoing the joys of rural India. They're coming to cities and they're actually finding a better future. And that's, that's why Gandhi really didn't get it right, is he really didn't understand what, what was going on in cities and that these places were actually places of hope, not places of deprivation. And India, of course, notably, is the most extreme case. The largest global happiness gap between cities and rural areas is actually in India, despite Gandhi. Now, there are two exceptions down here. These are places where uh, the rural dwellers are happier than the urban dwellers. This data comes from 2005 to 2007, where Iraq's cities were experiencing certain adverse shocks, uh, as perhaps the US Air Force would call them. Uh, and uh, Thailand, I put Thailand down to Bangkok's traffic jams as being the best thing of this. Now, one of the points of this is that, in fact, Urban poverty is not necessarily a sign that cities are failing. It can often be a sign that cities are succeeding. And the reason for this is that cities don't make people poor, at least not most of the time. Cities attract poor people. The favelas attract poor people. They attract poor people with the promise of economic opportunity. They attract them with better schools, better public health systems. In the US, they attract poor people with the ability to get around without cars. Right, my own work with Matthew Kahn finds that where you build new subway stops in America, poverty rates go up. That isn't a sign that the subway stops are impoverishing the local residents. It's a sign that they're actually attracting poor people with the ability to get around. Now, there are still issues with concentrated poverty. When the areas of the poor become walled off, when they're not part of the larger urban community, then they can become dead ends. But don't ask yourself when you see a city what the poverty rate is and think that that's a measure of whether or not it's failing. Ask yourself whether or not there's mobility. Ask yourself whether or not the people are getting out. Ask yourself whether or not they're getting out more than the people who live in the rural areas that, they're, that they've left behind. And indeed, it's really important, I think in particular, that you never benchmark the life in a favela against our own lives, right? Against, certainly against my own life, against the life of a, of a prosperous American, right? We have to benchmark it against the life in the rural Northeast, the life that they left behind. And that's the, that's the right question in terms of asking yourself whether or not it's doing something good. Now, the rise of cities in the 20th century, the rise of developing world cities, is deeply related to the constant dance of technology and urban areas. And as technology changes, there are both centripetal and centrifugal moments, moments in which technology pulls people into urban cores and moments in which technology pushes people away. Um, 
I like starting with an aqueduct, of course, because there's a tendency of, of you know, people who work in Silicon Valley to think that technology was something that was invented in Stanford in 1969. Uh, that, in fact, important technologies that have shaped cities are thousands of years old. And I don't think that there's actually a single technology that's ever proved to be more, than, more important for cities than this. Because, in fact, the most important job of local government is clean water. Because there is no crime wave that is more deadly than a cholera epidemic. Um, now, the 19th century was a great period of centripetal technologies, starting with transportation and then building up. So we pulled people towards cities. And think about a world in which, at the start of the, of the 19th century, we had just incredibly high transportation costs that meant that people had to live near the, the farms that they lived on in order to eat. Right? In 1816, it cost as much to ship goods 30 miles over land as it did to ship them across the entire Atlantic Ocean. Right? And so our cities remained small. They were tied to, to small waterways. Then gradually, transportation costs declined. And a global economy emerged. And it was an economy that, that was based on a transportation network. And cities arose at the nodes on that, that network. Every one of the 20 largest cities in the US in 1900 was built on a major waterway, from the oldest, New York and Boston, typically where the river meets the sea, to the newest, Minneapolis, on the northernmost navigable point on the Mississippi River. Right? If we think about the cities of Latin America, they are almost uniformly having some major transportation network, whether or not it's, it has to do with sugar or it has to do with coffee plantations. Transportation is playing a major role throughout it. And then industries come up around the transportation nodes. So this is Chicago. Right? The linchpin of a great watery arc that goes all the way from New York to New Orleans, made by canals right, that actually connect the Mississippi River system to the Great Lake system. And it becomes the hub for several great industries. But perhaps the one that's most famous is the stockyards. It's very similar, actually, to Buenos Aires during exactly the same time period and for very similar reasons, which is that you're trying to transport the wealth of the Americas, the wealth of the great farmland of the Americas, to the markets of the East. And that requires transforming corn, wheat, into some other portable product. So initially in America, they transformed it into whiskey right, in the southern Pennsylvania valleys. And that, that was both portable and potable and relatively durable. And then we transformed it into salted pork in the Ohio River Basin. And that's why Cincinnati grew up as America's porkopolis, a city built around pigs. And pigs, of course, are corn with feet. And then, of course, you have this Chicago, which is a city built on beef. Right? And those stockyards are about taking the cows that are fed on the corn of Iowa, which walk on the hoof to Chicago, and then get slaughtered. And here's the important point. The critical element in shipping the cows is refrigeration. It's exactly the same thing as the frigoríficos, which travel, carry the beef of Argentina to the markets of the East. And the guy in America who's responsible for those frigoríficos is Armour. Right? Armour is the guy who figures out, or his engineer figures out, that you want to put the frozen blocks on top of the beef rather than below it so the cold water drips down and keeps the beef cold so you can keep it sanitary for the march to the east. Centripetal technologies. All this transportation pulls things in around the nodes, creates the factories that cluster around the rail yards. Um, another centripetal technology, right? public transportation, collective transportation. These are the horse-drawn omnibuses that enable people to still live within the city but live slightly farther out. Uh, another tr centripetal ten technology, the skyscraper. And the skyscraper is, of course, the, a, a tall building with a load-bearing steel or cast iron skeleton. It's a new form of technology of, of its time, and it makes it possible to build up. Of course, it requires a transportation technology as well, which is the safety elevator. Right? So the two of them come together to make skyscrapers possible. I think one of the reasons that I like the skyscraper story so much is that it emphasizes the way that cities create things. So this building, Chicago's home insurance building, is often shown as being the first skyscraper. And its architect, William LeBaron Jenny, is often depicted as being the father of the skyscraper. But of course, there is an incredibly lively architectural history debate about this. Does Jenny deserve this title? Does this building deserve this title? Because in fact, only the front two walls have a steel-bearing skeleton. The back two walls have traditional heavy masonry walls that, bear, that carry the load. And you know, there are other steel, ske steel skeleton buildings that go back earlier. Think about the Crystal Palace in, in London 20 years before. Think about St. Augustine's in Paris in 1870, which has a steel skeleton to hold up its, its flanks. So steel skeletons are in the air. And so among the Americanists, at least, there's a debate. Does Jenny deserve this title? Or perhaps Louis Sullivan? Or perhaps Daniel Burnham for flat, flat iron? Or Adler? Or Root? Or the great fireproofing engineer Peter B. White? Now, any attempt to try and find a single parent of the skyscraper misses the point. 
All of these people knew each other. Both Sullivan and Burnham were apprentices in Jenny's office. They all stole ideas from each other. They all built upon each other's innovations. And collectively, they created it. Collectively, they made the city, this, this skyscraper work. Right? It's not about one person. This has always been about how cities work. I mean, think about Renaissance Florence. In some sense, a mundane city built on banking and wool. On another city, uh, sense, a city that created magic because of a chain of creativity that starts when Brunelleschi figures out the basic mathematics of linear perspective, how to make two-dimensional spaces seem three-dimensional. He then passes it along to Donatello, who puts that idea into action in low-relief sculpture on the wall of Orson Michele, who passes it along to Masaccio, who puts it in painting in the Brancacci Chapel, that marvelous painting of, of St. Peter finding a silver coin in the belly of a fish. Right? And this three-dimensionality enables lots and lots of artists to figure out things. So Fra Filippo Lippi, that less than saintly monk who learns from Botticelli, uh, who learns from uh, Masaccio, uh, Brunelleschi, uh, Botticelli who learns from, from Fra Filippo Lippi, and so forth, a chain of genius, each of whom riff on each other's ideas. This is what cities do that matters. This is how they change the world, and they're still doing it today. In Detroit, about the same time period, a similar cluster of genius occurs around a different problem of trying to produce the mass-produced car. Now, this character came to Detroit as a young man, um, and Detroit was yet another inland port, and he got his start working on engines for Detroit dry dock. He then used his expertise to work for Thomas Alva Edison and learned a little bit from him, and then he launched himself into this fight to find cheap transportation, to create tra cheap transportation. But he was hardly the only person in Detroit doing it. It was not just about Ford, it's about the Dodge brothers, the Fisher brothers, David Dunbar, Buick, Ransom E. Olds, Billy Durant nearby Flint. A cluster of genius. In some sense, it was like Silicon Valley in the 1960s, right? Smart people, all of whom stole each other's ideas, supplied each other with parts, supplied each other with financing. It was an urban innovation machine, right? And it did an amazing thing, which was to produce the cheap car. Now, in the short run, this was enormously productive. But in the longer run, the very technology that Ford unleashed was the very undoing of his city. Right? In some sense, one way to think about this is that successful cities at the start of the 19th century were marked by three things. Small, people, small firms, smart people, and connections to the outside world. The same three things, let me say them again since I flubbed it. Small firms, smart people, and connections to the outside world are, are important today. How far away from that are large, vertically integrated factories like Ford's River Rouge? Right? These entities don't need the city. They don't give to the city. They aren't part of the city. They follow the inexorable logic of cost minimization. Right? And so when conditions change, like, for example, a radical decline in transportation costs over the 20th century, it just no longer made sense to put a factory next to a train stop or next to a port in the, in the Great Lakes. And so factories left. They moved to lower cost locations. They moved to suburbs, and they crossed the ocean. The age of the industrial city in the US and in the West was brief. It came and it went, in part because heavy industry is just such a poor match for urbanization. It's just not part of the same fabric, the connections that make cities work. Producing ordinary products at a large scale is not something that cities are good at. Cities are good at innovation. Cities are good at services. They're not good at doing things that require massive amounts of space and not a lot of creativity. And so this is the cost of moving a ton of mile by rail. It declines by 90%. And so cities redefine themselves around this. They also redefine themselves around the car, right? Henry Ford's cars, in some sense, provided plenty of short-run benefit, right? provided great wages for the workers of Detroit, provided mobility for far-flung American farmers. Um, but on the other hand, they also completely changed the way that Americans lived in their cities. And they moved to areas that are really built around the automobile. This is actually France. This is uh, sprawl, sprawl living in, in France. And it's not really sprawl. It's best not seen as sprawl. The important point is it's car-based living when we think about this. When you have suburbs that are still connected by public transportation, they're fundamentally urban in a different way uh, than sprawl is. And again, I'm an economist, right? It's not that in any sense that I share the sort of common urbanist hate for the car, right? I think that people should be free to make choices that they want. If the average commute by car in the US is 24 minutes. The average commute by public transport is 48 minutes, right? It's understandable why people like their cars. What I'm hostile to is subsidizing the car, using general tax revenues to provide highways for, that enable people to drive for free. I'm hostile to not charging drivers for the social costs of their action, be it pollution or congestion, just as importantly. It's not that, in fact, no one should drive. It's that we need to have sensible policies that encourage people to pay the cost of their driving, not that we need to out-illegalize it going forward. Um, now, all this mobility meant that America reshaped itself. 
right? And we had to move to places that were defined not by transportation linkages, but by mostly warm weather. Right? In some sense, this is about the rise of the consumer cities, cities that are based around consumption advantages. And apparently what we've learned is that Americans really like living in warmer places. So this is population growth, 2000 to 2010 on January temperature. Now, there are three things rolled together in this. This is also about these places having relatively pro-business policies after World War II, the war of places. And it's also about them having relatively pro-housing policies. You can't understand why Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, and Phoenix each added a million people as metropolitan areas between 2000 and 2010 without also understanding understanding that they make it incredibly easy to mass produce housing. Whereas in San Francisco, in Boston, they have erected a maze of housing regulations that make it incredibly difficult to supply anything. Um, but of course, it's also just about warmer temperature. It's also about the, the fact that people like mildness. One way of thinking about this move is with happiness data. And this is from a newer paper of mine that's a map of self-reported happiness across the US. Now, you want to take this with a grain of salt, because some differences in happiness are just cultural. So the New Yorkers, for example, famously don't say that they're happy. They have very low self-reported happiness levels. Now, in some sense, anyone who's ever seen a Woody Allen movie should know that that, you know, <laughs> confessing that you're happy to a reporter is kind of like saying you're a moron if you're a New Yorker. Uh, uh, the countervailing evidence for this is, in fact, New Yorkers commit suicide at very low rates. So in fact, even though the self-reported happiness is low, the suicide rates are, are also low, which suggests that you probably shouldn't take it very seriously. But the rest of this data does have at least seem to have some bite. And the patterns are not surprising. This is sort of the heart of the old Rust Belt. This is Scranton, where I was yesterday, old coal mining territory. And these are the growing areas of the Sun Belt. And when you just look at the relationship between population growth and happiness, right, the places that are growing are happy. The places that are shrinking are declining. Now, what's really interesting is when you go back into the historical data, you find that, in fact, these places were unhappy first. That it's not that they became unhappy later. They were unhappy in the 1940s. That, in fact, these coal mining towns were not places of great joy. In fact, it turns out that when guys have to go into a coal mine every day, starting at age 11, uh, before they die at the age of 59 of lung disease, I'm actually describing my, mother, my, my wife's grandfather's life in, in this, their lives aren't all that happy. Um, and those places declined, whereas the places that are growing are places that were always happy. So what you see is an increasing move towards, towards cities, towards areas that cater to consumers, that provide amenities that make life good. And in some sense, the important point of this is that when you think about the long and competitive advantage of a city, an ability to attract and retain talent is huge. I often say that the most important economic development strategy at the local level is to train and attract smart people and then more or less get out of their way. But this is not less a fair government, right? Because a training and attracting smart people requires both good schools, it requires safety, it requires good transportation that enables you to get around closely. Right? There is no such thing as a sensible libertarian in a city, just as there is no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole, as the old line says. Right? In a city, you actually do require government to deal with the downsides of density. Right? I'm a Chicago PhD. I'm very proud of that. There are many things that I think the government is doing that they shouldn't be doing, both at the city and at the local level. But there is no private solution for making sure that water is, is drinkable, or that roads are usable, or that streets are safe. Right? These are all entirely valid and critical elements of government. And one of the things that we see in the rise of poor world urbanism is that these are places without the governmental quality to deliver humane cities. And that's, in some sense, why there's such a great challenge. This is the same fact for the US. So hit with a move to sun and sprawl, this is what happened to our older cities. This is two iconic images from New York City of my youth, where it felt as if not just President Ford, but history itself was telling New York to drop dead. This is what happened to the populations of the 10 largest cities in the US in 1950, all of them declining. And it looked as if the age of the city had come and gone, and not just in the East. But you know, in 1971, two jokers put up a billboard on the highway leaving Seattle asking the last person to leave the city to please turn out the lights, right? Because Boeing had been cutting back on the number of jobs. And just as no one could imagine uh, Detroit with the smaller General Motors, no one could imagine a Seattle with a smaller Boeing. Before Amazon, before Costco, before Microsoft, and Starbucks is at best started to brew some coffee, right? These new companies, these companies that did not exist at all transformed the city. Uh, this is Milan. This is the Liebeskind uh, vision of, of Milan Central. It's the same story for Milan. It's the same story for Boston. It's the same story for San Francisco. These were cities that looked as dead as Detroit or Buffalo 40 years ago, and now they could not possibly be looking more, more vibrant. Right? It's about a change. It's about a technological change. And in some sense, it's a, a 
puzzling fact. Here, here are just a couple of ways of looking at this, this growth. So this is the relationship. The top line shows the relationship between population change, 2000 to 2010 initial density. The bottom line shows the relationship between income in 2000 and population density across counties in the US. So the bottom line shows you this fact that cities tend to be much more productive economically, tend to have higher wages. The densest tenth of counties have incomes that are 50% higher than the least dense counties. There's a huge economic literature on so-called agglomeration economies of why we become more productive in cities. Um, there are certainly lots of different theories about this. Some people credit selection. So New Yorkers like to think that smart people just happen to live in New York, and that's why they're productive. It's nothing about the city. Uh, other, other theories might privilege things like just having more productive amenities in the area that both attract firms and people and make them more productive. I think the bulk of 40 years of literature on this suggests that there really are treatment effects of, of uh, density that make firms and people more productive. This population change really does show you that whereas Americans at the start of the 19th century were leaving their dense enclaves on the eastern seaboard to populate the empty spaces between the oceans, at the start of the 21st century, instead of spreading out, we're clustering in. You also see this in property values. Over the last 15 years, there's been a tremendous tilt within our successful cities. Whereas the suburbs have held value barely, it's the central cities that have gone up in value. The demand is for space at the urban core, and not for space at the edge. These are the exact two lines in the, in, across the European Union. They show exactly the same pattern. Faster population growth in dense areas, much higher incomes levels in, in dense areas. Um, how do we understand this? We live in a world in which distance is dead, in which the cyber seers and the techno prophets told us that all of this freedom to communicate electronically would eliminate face-to-face -face contact and the cities that enable that contact. And yet, both in the developing world and in the developed world, cities appear to be more vital than ever. I think the resolution to this paradox is that what globalization and new technologies have done is they've created a world in which the returns to being smart are much higher than ever. In part, this is because innovations can be sourced or sold anywhere on the planet. We play on a global stage. In part, this is because we have a more complicated world. And the more complicated an idea is, the easier it is to get lost in translation. Anyone who's ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your subject. It's knowing whether or not anything you're saying is getting through. Right? And we have evolved over millions of years to have these wonderful cues for communicating comprehension or confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room with one another. This is why face-to-face -face contact still matters. This is why right, the companies, which of all the companies in the world, should be able to enable long-distance work. Google doesn't say, go home. Right, just dial it in. Yahoo doesn't say go on. Marissa Meyer demands that people show up. She builds the Googleplex, right? They want everyone on top of each other constantly communicating with one another. Claudio just took me to his, uh, his administrative suite upstairs, right? Are they all sitting like, you know, like, like university deans normally do, surrounded by vast open offices, enjoying all the perquisites of, of privacy that their power has made possible? Of course not. They're right on top of each other, right? They're right next to each other. They're communicating with each other because this is how information works. This is how knowledge works. And in a world in which knowledge is more valuable, connection is more valuable. Density is more valuable. right? And this is why cities have ultimately come back. And this is why, of course, some cities have done better than others. Um, cities that are skilled have come back. This is actually just as, as an aside. I should have put the slide earlier. This is the, the relationship between population and income for the US, Brazil, China, and urban. The thing that you should take away from this is that um, the connection within Brazil between size and population size and income, between density and income, is exactly the same as in the US. It's actually somewhat higher for, for China and somewhat higher for India. But exactly the same facts that we think we know for the US in terms of density income hold for, hold for Brazil. Which cities have done better in the US? It's skills, right? Because skilled cities are the ones that are information intensive, because education is a complement to density. Education gives you communication skills, and it gives you something that's worth communicating with each other. This is why skilled cities do well and unskilled cities do poorly. This is the relationship. So this shows, but just by quintile, I've separated out all the uh, counties in the US on the basis of their skill levels, based on just share of the population with a college degree. These are the most skilled areas, population growth of about 13%. The least skilled three-fifths are about 3%. Enormous difference in population growth uh, between skilled and unskilled places. I've done this for the US, Brazil, and uh, India and China as well. So this is the US coefficients. And I'm sorry about this. This is new work. So it's, of course, I don't have it in a shape that's all pretty yet. The thing that you should take about this is this coefficient is 2 in the US, and it's 7 in Brazil. This is for population change. This is 0.6. This is income change in skills. This is 17 in Brazil. Skills are really important in the US, right? This is a big relationship. They are vastly more important in Brazil.
Skills are vastly more powerful as predictors of urban success here than they are in the place where, in which we found this stuff out. This is university graduates and, where, and wage residuals. So this is looking at the share of the population with a college degree and your earnings holding your years of schooling constant. And the typical fact for the US is as the share with a college degree goes up by 10%, your wages also go up by 10%. The Brazilian number is much larger. Right, that actually having skilled people around you is much more valuable. And uh, in some sense, this just reminds us, this is just looking at PISA mass scores and log of GDP across countries, that the long run destiny of cities, of people, of countries, rests on the bedrock of human capital. Right? That skills ultimately are the most important thing for the long run. Now, the thing that, that the urbanists must remind us, of course, even in an educational institution, is that many of the most important skills are not those that are given even in places like INSPIR. Right? And INSPIR is much better than most at actually providing skills that are relevant for the outside world, certainly more so than, let's say, my own employer. Um, the, um, you know, the, the most important skills are the ones that are learned on the street, on the job, in the world around you. It's what the great English economist Alfred Marshall was talking about 120 years ago when he wrote that in dense clusters, the mysteries of the trade become no mystery but are, as it were, in the air. This is still true in places like Silicon Valley. It's still true in places like Wall Street. Right? It's still true throughout the world. And when I think about the skills that are learned, I can't think of any skill that's more important for the long run strength and resilience of a city than the talent and inclination to be an entrepreneur. 50 years ago, the economist Benjamin Chinitz was comparing New York and Pittsburgh and noting that New York appeared to be more resilient than Pittsburgh was even then. He argued that this was a legacy of New York's industrial concentration in garments, in making clothes. Because this was an industry with very few barriers to entry and very low economies of scale. And hence, anyone with a good idea and a couple of sewing machines could get started. Right? It was a mother of entrepreneurship, consequently. And the entrepreneurs who would start there would go on to do other things, because in some sense, entrepreneurial human capital is fungible. You would go on, you would start making garments, and then you'd build skyscrapers. Or you'd start a movie studio. You'd start a bank. Right? Because once you're good at thinking about what products will sell in one industry, you move on to another. By contrast, Pittsburgh had coal mines, which meant US steel, which meant company men who solved logistics problems to make the company work. Fantastically good in the short run, very good for producing profits for the company in the short run. But these guys are not entrepreneurs. Right? These guys are people who are good at solving particular problems, not for thinking for new business opportunities. It is amazing, given how mediocre our measures of entrepreneurship are, that they do such a good job of predicting urban employment growth. So this is employment growth 1977 to 2010. And here my measure of entrepreneurship is just average establishment size. So one is the lowest average establishment size. Five is the biggest across these areas. Huge gaps. And this is true no matter how, how you cut it. This is not about particular industries. This is not, a true, uh, not about particular regions of the country. Any way you look at this data, within region, within industry, any way you see the strong correlation between having lots of little firms and growth. Equivalently, you could use the share of employment in startups in initial period, which shows almost exactly the same facts. Again, small firms, nimble firms, an abundance of entrepreneurial human capital. This is the stuff of which urban success is made. Now, urban innovation also helps make cities more fun, more livable. right? Um, and this is happening around us in, in areas all the time. So this is Zipcar. And Zipcar bills itself as being about the sharing economy, as if that's something new. Cities have always been about sharing. What is an urban restaurant other than a shared dining room, a shared backyard? What is an urban park other than a, like a shared yard? Right? Cities have always been about sharing. It's one of the things that's wonderful about cities. Um, but the difference is the technology lets us share more things. So why couldn't you have Zipcar in New York in the 1970s? Well, you'd go to Times Square to pick up your car, right? and there'd be like a dead body in the trunk because right? it was New York in the 1970s, and guys did stuff like that. And it'd be really bad, and you'd be really sad about this thing, and you'd say, please, I'd like to go, go have someone else drive me, please, so this doesn't happen to me again. Today, with the technology, right, you know where, who had the car less. There's no problem with this. We have this amazing thing with Uber, in the sense that people appear, appear to completely trust having strangers in their car because of the electronic fingerprints that are left all, the, all over the place. Right? So the new technology enables more sharing, and in some sense, this continues to strengthen cities.
Now, can governments engineer innovation? This seems less clear. Things like innovation districts, this is Boston, are very popular in different, different ways. I, I tend to be somewhat more doubtful about this, although the innovation district itself is a perfectly sensible thing. I think it's very hard for governments to actually micromanage innovation and entrepreneurship. Certainly the lending programs that governments have done have often been a disaster, right? It's very hard for actual venture capitalists to be good venture capitalists. It's even worse for public officials to be good venture capitalists. It's not something that, that's, that's natural. But I do think it's worthwhile figuring out if we can perhaps train more entrepreneurial people. Um, so I'm, I'm working with a project called The Possible Project, which is rolling out entrepreneurship training in a high poverty school in Boston. And I don't know if this will work. We're doing a randomized control trial of it. They've been doing it for about five years. But in some sense, we need to work more on making sure that the poorer residents of every city figure out ways that they can nimbly work their way through the new opportunities that are produced. Because in some sense, while I told you that cities shouldn't apologize for their poverty, they also shouldn't stop worrying about it. Right? That they need to make sure that the skills are being delivered to everyone, not just for the good of those people, but because all sorts of wonderful things can come out of talented entrepreneurs who come out of poverty as well. Right? We can all benefit from this, and every mind that, that's, le that's left away is a waste to all of humanity. Now, the most entrepreneurial place I've ever been on the planet is the Dharavi slum of Mumbai. Right? It is a place that is just teeming with entrepreneurial talent. right? Guys are, are sewing brassieres in one corner, and you think you're in the Lower East Side of New York in 1905. And a little bit further down there, women who are recycling plastics on, on the ground. And then there's a ceramics cluster. And they're making pots that they're so proud of that they won't even take any money from you for them. And then, of course, you go outside, and you see a kid defecating in an unpaved road. And you know, the water isn't fit to drink. The electricity is at best intermittent. right? And you know, there's no way you can pull, drive a car through any of this thing. So how are you doing your transportation networks on this thing? And it reminds you, again, of this fundamental point that there are also demons that come with density. If two people are close enough to exchange an idea face to face, they're also close enough to, to exchange a contagious disease. And ultimately, cities need government to tame those demons. Cities need effective government. And it is precisely because. Brazil has faced some of those demons more recently than we have in the West, and in fact, Brazil has a lot to teach the world on this. Now, this is the US path of, of death rates uh, in New York from, from uh, diseases. And you can see that there was just an enormous change in this. A boy born in 1900 in, the US, in New York City could expect to live seven years less than the national average. Today, life expectancy is about three years longer in New York. But that didn't happen cheaply or easily. America's cities and towns were spending as much on clean water at the start of the 20th century as the federal government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army. Right? Enormous amount of spending. And one of the points that I will make over and over again, which is why I think it's so exciting that INSPIRE has an engineering program to work with these economists, is that engineering and economics go together. One without the other is always a mistake. And I'll give two examples of this that's that are important, one of which is this thing, the Croton Aqueduct, right? a very major part of New York City infrastructure. And the story that I was raised on as a child was that New York was filthy until these wonderful engineers built the aqueduct. And the aqueduct brought in the clean waters from out of the city. And then it flushed out the filth. And suddenly, New York was happy and, and clean and safe and healthy. OK, here's the problem with that. When was the Croton Aqueduct built? 1842, right there. Anyone see a break in the time series? Anyone see a radical reduction in death rates around 1842? Right here. This is where you should be looking. No. You don't have to be a time series expert to know there's no change there. For 25 years after Croton, the death rates stay high. And the reason for this is that, in fact, the poor people still don't connect to it. It costs money. They've subsidized it a little bit. They've put some hydrants, but the hydrants are far away, so people don't want to walk to carry water. And uh, people continue to use the shallow wells that are right next to, to latrines. They continue to die, consequently for 25 years. My own five greats grandfather, great, 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 great grandfather, died in this one, 1849, seven years after the Croton Aqueduct was finished right, of cholera. Um, again, it's about combining engineering and economics, because it's only until after 1867, when you have this Board of Health, that actually says to landlords, you've got to actually use this technology. Right? We're going to impose fines on you. We're going to create penalties if you don't actually connect that you actually get this. You actually have to have incentives in play. It's exactly the same point about roads. Right? The economists Gilles Durantan and Matthew Turner have identified the fundamental law of highway traffic, which is that vehicle miles traveled increase roughly one for one with highway miles built. If you build it, they will drive it. Right? So you can double the amount of road space in Sao Paulo. You can build overpasses and underpasses. And as long as you continue to make them for free, you will just get more drivers and you will just get more traffic jams. You actually have to do something that rationalizes this. And the most successful economics idea is to charge people for the social cost of their action, to charge people for, for this. They've had electronic road pricing in Singapore for many years. Now they've had congestion pricing for 40. It's the second dense country in the world, and its streets move quickly. 
because they charge people to drive. They charge them more during peak periods. I know you can't do this on existing roads. I know it's politically impossible, although I'll continue to argue for it because I'm an economist who isn't looking to get elected to anything. But when you have a new road, you got to put in a price now. Make the principle of paying for roads as, as clear as possible. Of course, along with this, along with, with you know, paying for roads, you need public transit options. There's an old line that 40 years of transportation economics at Harvard can be boiled down to four words. Bus good, train bad, OK? <laughs> Curitiba, bus rapid transit, it's a great system. And it's the system that's right for most of the developing world. And it needs to be one in which you know, the gospel needs to be preached. Um, there's a lot to be, you know, the, the literature on crime and punishment is building. And I think I, I want to sort of highlight just one thing that we know from this, which is the rise of community policing involved to mean two different things. So um, community policing is, is, in New York, came to mean a very tough form of policing as associated with, with Ray Kelly, use of technology, use of arresting people for minor crimes. And sometimes that's necessary, right? Sometimes it's necessary to be tough to keep the city safe. But it also creates terrible human costs while doing so. And while certainly technology that measures crime is vital, it really is the answer to itself. And again, this sort of emphasizes that there's human element of everything. There's another version of community policing, which is connecting with the community, which is buying trust. And that's the, the Boston version that's associated with Ed Davis. This is Ed Davis after the Boston Marathon. He's the, head of the former head of the Boston Police Department, which is about building trust with the community. Right? And this was really shown in evidence. They had some, some Occupy Boston, Occupy Wall Street movements. And th these guys totally screwed it up. They had this harsh attitude towards the protesters. It got very ugly. It was, it was brutal. Boston had none of that. And you, and you know why? Because they had social skills that they had developed over time. The first thing the Boston police did with the protesters, they bought them coffee and donuts. Because that's Boston, right? That's what they do. They buy coffee and donuts. The critical thing to make policing work is to actually build trust with the community. It doesn't work if the police are seen as being an occupying army. Um, now, uh, I'm going to skip over this, but this is a story that, that my teacher, Jose Shankman, likes to teach, which is the, that one of the things that's really important in crime, in drugs, is to make sure, and this is a story that's told about decreasing homicides in, in Rio, is making sure that crimes are sold by the dentist model rather than, drugs are sold by the dentist model rather than by the supermarket model. And the idea here is that any commodity can be sold anonymously in a place. So that's a supermarket. I go to the supermarket. I don't care who's behind the, the thing. I buy the product. I take it to them. Or it can be sold by a professional in a personal relationship, right? This is someone, I've got a dentist, I go to the dentist. If someone else were there, I wouldn't open my mouth for them. I'm not going to do it. Okay, this model is a recipe in the drug markets and illegal markets is a recipe for violence. This one is not. Okay, if you have space that is recognized as drug markets, then there will be battles for control over that turf, right, because it comes with money. If all the relationships are personal, meaning dealer to user, right, you can't just kill a dealer and get all of, the, all of their, their clients, right? So one is a recipe for violence, the other one is not. So pushing drugs markets, not to try in sort of in US fashion to, to pretend as if somehow they were going to eliminate the human desire to use drugs right, in some quixotic attempt, but just making sure that drugs are sold by dealers, not by in, in open public spaces, seems to have very significant effects on crime. And we've seen this in New York as well. Finally, let me just make two other points, and then I'll, then I'll end. When it comes to the physical city, and again, you know, cities are, are at their heart. Cities are people, not structures, but cities desperately need those structures in order to survive. But it's really important that with the physical city, we, we move between the sill and caribness of nimbyism, not in my backyardism, opposition to everything, and monumentalism, just building for the sake of building. Right? So nimbyism is something that's particularly prone to you know, former Anglo-Saxon colonies of a variety of different forms. This is Mumbai, which for much of the past 50 years suffered under a floor area ratio maximum of one and a quarter. It means the average height has to be one and a, one and a quarter. Right? This is putting an incredible ceiling on how much this city can grow up. It ensures the city grows out. It ensures the city is far too expensive. Right? It doesn't prevent the growth of Mumbai. It just ensures that the growth of Mumbai is utterly dysfunctional. Of course, this is Astana. This is another example, which is you just build structures because they're beautiful structures. And far too often in this world, we see city leaders think that building structures is the only thing that you need. It's part of what you need, but they need to be humane. They need to be dedicated to the needs of particular people, not built on their own. Um, Jane Jacobs got that point more than anyone else, that structures needed to be humane. But she also veered a little bit too much 
into the nimbiest category. And this came from her passion for historic preservation, with which I somewhat agree. My father was an architectural historian, right? And I believe that our, many of our older buildings are treasures just as precious as any of those hanging in any museum. But on the other hand, cities need to be you know, free to change and to build. And in some sense, some of the most exciting architectural moments are those in which there's a dialogue between an architect of the present and an architect of the past, right? And Jacobs took the view that you know, she strongly supported historic preservation, pretty much always and everywhere, and argued that you know, this was not just about creating an aesthetic link to the past, but also about promoting affordability. Because she looked at old buildings and noted that they were cheap, and new buildings and noted they were expensive, which led her to conclude that the only, was that the only way to preserve affordability was to make sure that no one built any new buildings on top of old buildings. Right? This is not how supply and demand works. Right? If you have an expensive town, that you cannot build on, you risk turning it into a boutique town that's affordable only to the wealthy. You do not need to look further than in her own home district of Greenwich Village, which she fought so hard to turn into a preservation district, right, to see what happens when you do that. This was an area that was affordable to middle-income people in the 1950s when she lived there. Now townhouses start at $8 million because it has been frozen in amber for 40 years. Now, I love Greenwich Village. It is a tremendously fun and beautiful place to be it may well have been the right decision to preserve it as a historic preservation district. But don't tell me it's a recipe towards affordability, right? Because it's not, right? There's a, there are trade-offs on this one way or the other. And we cannot make good policy on this unless we recognize that there are trade-offs. This is declining production of housing in New York. This is rising prices, right? The, the, there are no repealing the laws of supply and demand. One of the reasons why I think that cities need to build is that they also are the solution, or part of a solution, towards an environmental problem. Now, it's often believed, it's often acted as if cities are somehow or other antithetical to the environment. That there are cities, and there's greenery, and cities are bad for the environment, and you know, wouldn't it be just better if we didn't have it? There's an element of this that is true, that in fact, rural poverty is actually pretty green. And in fact, if you look at traditional agriculture, it's actually you know, pretty green. It's also incredibly poor involving incredibly short life expectancies and you know, uh, conditions that we should not wish on, any, on anyone. But when countries get richer, they face a choice. They face a choice between higher density living and lower density living. And there's a substantial difference in the greenness of these two options. And I like to make this point with an anecdote about a young Harvard College graduate who in a beautiful spring day in 1844 went for a walk in the woods outside of Concord, Massachusetts. And he did a little fishing, and the fishing was good because there hadn't been much rain lately. But he came to cook the fish into a soup. And as he cooked, the wind flicked the flames to the nearby dry grass. And the fire started, and it spread, and it spread. And by the time it was done, it was a raging inferno. It was an inferno that had wiped out hundreds of acres of natural woodland. A whole natural ecosystem had been destroyed by the carelessness of, his, of this young man. In his own day, he was castigated as an enemy of the environment. The Concord Freeman, the local paper, called him a flibberty gibbet. I have no idea how anyone can translate that into Portuguese. Uh, but he was a flibberty gibbet, which was pretty bad. And indeed, it's hard not to think they were right. I don't know of any young man in 1844 who did as much damage, living in Cambridge or Boston, who did as much damage to the environment as he did. Now, of course, he is today revered as the secular saint of American environmentalism. His name is Henry David Thoreau, and his book Walden preaches a gospel of what a wonderful thing it is to live surrounded by nature. Now, it might have been wonderful for Thoreau. Maybe he enjoyed burning down all those woods. Uh, but uh, I take his life to have a different moral. I think Thoreau's life teaches us that we are a destructive species, and that if you love nature, you should probably stay away from it so you don't cause it so much harm, as indeed Thoreau should have done, done a lot of good to nature by staying away from it. Now, I know of what I speak, because when I started acquiring small children, I moved from about here to about here, not far away from Thoreau did. And I started doing almost as much to damage to the environment as Thoreau did, what with the driving and the home heating and all this other stuff. And this comes from work together with UCLA environmental economist Matthew Kahn. And we measure up carbon emissions associated with living in different parts of the country. And basically what we find is that the places that look green are brown and the places that look brown are green. And the reason for this is driving distances, typically. Americans, even in dense areas, actually are not taking a lot of public transportation outside of New York. They're just, but they are driving substantially shorter distances. Um, and they also are holding income and family size constant, living in much smaller units. Right? And between these two things, it's associated with much less carbon. Uh, one way of thinking about this is if the great growing economies of India and China alone see their per capita carbon emissions rise to those seen in the sprawling United States, global carbon emissions go up by about 130%. 130% just from that increase. If they stop at the level seen in wealthy but hyperdense Hong Kong, global carbon emissions go up by less than 
right? So there's a huge difference associated with these economies evolving in one way rather than, an, than another. Um, now, I don't mean to suggest that, you know, again, let me restress this. I don't think that everyone should live in cities. In no sense am I suggesting that, right? I think that Brazilians have choices, Americans have choices. That's the way things should be. But I do think we want to make sure that we have policies that don't artificially push people away from cities. We don't want policies that make it impossible to build or difficult to build in urban areas. We want to make sure that people can build spaces. Every time you say no to a new apartment that's being built, you say no to a family or a person who wants to find their future in the city. You're making life more expensive for the people who already live in those cities. You're saying no to the opportunity of something magical happening in the urban areas. Every time you subsidize driving, Every time you don't charge people for the congestion that they create, you're both making the city dysfunctional and you're pushing people artificially away from it. And I think most importantly, right, for the long run future of Brazil's cities is, is to focus on the, the, the human capital that is ultimately the life's blood. And I think this is not just about formal education, but it's about thinking about more creative ways like these projects in inner city areas to actually try to train people to be entrepreneurs, to do other things. It's, as long as they are competitively provided, evaluated with randomized controlled trials, right, and then the big ones grow and the short ones shrink, you're enabling cities to, to use their natural advantage at competition and innovation to become better, to become fairer, to become more open. And I think ultimately, right, despite all the problems that currently exist in your country and in mine, I cannot help but look at the track record of humanity in cities and not be enormously hopeful because our species has been doing miraculous things when we come together, when we learn from each other in cities for thousands of years. Uh, I continue to believe that that will happen and that marvels will continue to come from people when they're connected with each other in urban areas. Thank you. Thank you.